Well, good afternoon, investors. Welcome to our first bull sessions of November. My name is Mark Robertson. I am founder and managing partner of Manifest Investing, and uh, we just do this program to explore stuff. Uh, every Tuesday, update a few things, and I love doing it with the magnificent mathematician from Mid Michigan, Ken Kavula. <laughs> Okay, that's getting really old. So we got to shelve that from the <laughs> well, as we go forward. Okay. The, re the reason I did it correctly is he's not here. He's not uh, here to say anything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we are joined by Kim Butcher and Matt Spielman in the back room. Good afternoon, guys, and welcome. Thank you for having us. For me. You guys feel free to chime in. Um, Matt, we are going to talk briefly about Morgan Housel's new book, and I don't know if you had a chance to look at it, but he's been pretty reliable in the past. Even I'm not that fast. He did do a uh, uh, podcast with Molly Fool, but I haven't even listened to that yet, but looking forward to it, though. Yeah, good stuff. All right, it is tax day, hence the, the bull with the Uncle Sam hat on the left. In fact, afterwards, uh, we're going to go vote. So I don't know if it's... It's not voting nationwide today, but there are quite a few places with uh, local elections going on. And uh, we are going to share some moments from our uh, New Orleans experience. That is New Orleans in the background of us there. And Ken and I did get marooned briefly in New Orleans. Um, it was a good time. Uh, uh, we did eat a few oysters. Yay, oysters. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and we're going to show you a, a brief segment of that program, which will also whet your appetite for a program we're going to do tomorrow night. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit here today about the consequences of core awareness, because one of the screens that we've generated here fairly recently, in fact, Kevin Gologli has done uh, quite a bit of work. He uses the core number fairly often in his screening efforts, and he's kind of nudged me back into to uh, thinking about what that might entail and what what might be involved there. And we're also going to take a look at a tiny case study of tax loss, tax related selling. So I, I mean, it's, it's actually a pretty good demonstration. So Ken, anything else you want to add to this? No, I'm ready to get going, Mark. So let's see what these slides look like today. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Pumpkin pie shakes are back at Portillo's, and this is just your reminder every week that Portillo's, although they should be, is not a sponsor of this program. And I did add the Acme Oyster House on the lower That's, left. And, and folks, if you've never been to New Orleans, uh, and if you like seafood, that this is quite a place. Uh, they not only have a, a place down in the French Quarter that's been there for a long, long, long time, but they have uh, one place out in the the near suburbs as well. And uh, their seafood is is top quality, and the the fresh oysters, the the fresh oysters on the half shell are absolutely magnificent. Very so really. If you, if you if you like Very that kind of stuff, I I greatly recommend the Acme Oyster House. All right, here's our standard disclaimer. This is an educational demonstration. No investment recommendation is intended. We will be talking about a few companies in real time. Please understand that anything that we talk about here is for illustration purposes only. We are quite literally trying to share our understanding and implementation of the method, methods, philosophies, uh, analysis, and techniques of the modern investment club movement. But please do your own homework before making any decision. If we own something, we will try to remember to tell you that. And uh, Ken, you keep trying to add this to our other disclaimers. Maybe we do need to add it to all of the chapter disclaimers, too. We assume you are smart enough to form your own opinions and make your own decisions about investing-related resources and investments. We are not the boss of you. All right. <laughs> okay, so if, you, if you are here, uh, and, and this is a pretty great audience that I recognize by name of so many of you, but if you are here brand new and you did not get uh, any information about our roundtable program, uh, drop us a, a note. Drop the note to nkabula1 at comcast.net and Natalie will put you on the MidMichigan roundtable 
uh, reminder list, and Mark and I uh, are two of the knights of the round table, along with Cy Lynch and Hugh McManus, plus a uh, just a whole slew of guests that we bring in that are uh, probably better stock pickers a lot of them than the four of us. But we bring them in, we talk about stocks, it's, it's very focused, we have a real good time. And if you'd like to come to that absolutely free program, which happens the last Tuesday of every month, uh, please uh, drop Natalie a note, she'll get you on the guest list, and then you'll get a reminder about when they are, and the reminder will have a direct link to registration in it. Okay, and if you'd like copies of these slides, or if you have questions, or suggestions for future topics, our two email addresses are right there. And I can actually uh, brag a little bit. Once again, I have reduced my inbox to almost empty. Just <laughs> thanks to those hours spent uh, uh, okay. thanks to American, Air, American Airlines. You guys can all thank American Airlines for that. <laughs> Sitting in Dallas for four hours helps immensely on your email. <laughs> so. All right. Let's get underway again with our weekly reminder, although as Ken and I discussed, we probably will find a, do, a way to do a little bit different version of this that might look at nearer term along with the long term perspective, because this doesn't change much for most of us, um, but most of us realize that it's a, a long term perspective. The one change that I did make is I restored the value line median appreciation projection. That's the one that's on their summary edition in the value line survey. And you can see that that one is there. The bounce back up in the market uh, shows that the the far bar, the bar on the farthest on the right has actually gone back to where it was, and uh, we're still, in our opinion, undervalued when it comes to many stocks. Mark, just for the number crunchers in our audience, uh, the value line median uh, talks about a three to five year number. Do you basically do the calculation using four years? Yes, basically always four years. Okay, so if you're trying to match these numbers, folks, you, you take that medium and uh, number, which uh, recently it was 75%, and what you want to do is annualize that using a, some real simple algebra. And when you annualize that uh, at four years, then you'll get the numbers that Mark is showing right here. And you're, you're basically going to get a number that places you in the neighborhood of the our median projected return. Keep in mind that our projected return is 2,800 stocks and does include dividends. So that's gonna give you a little bit of a difference, but um, again, different sample, different sample. All right, well, here's a favorite chart provided by Sean Mace. And uh, I, I like the chart just as a quick reminder, cause who knows what could happen the day after tomorrow or this afternoon when it comes to investing in fact, I didn't put it in here, Ken, because it's not a national election year, but one of the slides we shared in New Orleans is is from an old bull session where we basically proved in almost a, with a hard stopping slide that it doesn't matter who's running Congress or in the White House. You just didn't. It's, it certainly stopped all the questions from the New Orleans uh, audience, at least when they were really concerned about what would happen if we went from a Democratic president to a Republican president or the reverse. And also what would happen if you had a uh, split government or if you had split Congress and everything else. And we've done some work on that. Mark has had some wonderful slides. What I like, Mark, is that this is now 73 years of showing that 10% average that we constantly talking about and just a reaffirmation of how smart George Nicholson was uh, back in the early 40s when he said, I'm going to use 10 as the average return and therefore I think the clubs can do 15. Yeah, and there's your 10%. And yep. I mean, you, you can pick any one of these moments. Uh, the one that I think that is really was really potentially huge and it barely shows up on here was the collapse of the Soviet Union and the trouble in the late 1990s that was experienced in Russia and a couple other sovereign nations. Uh, it doesn't even show up on here. And it was actually a quite a cataclysmic, Mexico was one of the countries, uh, quite a cataclysmic event. And you can't even see it on here. It's not even mentioned. Well, Andy, I will also say, Mark, if you lived through the savings and loan crisis, you would have thought the world was coming to an end during those months. 
Uh, but I can't see that at all on the graph. It's pointed out, but I can't see it impacting yeah, the stock market at all. Yeah. I'm closing my eye and using a magnifying glass and I'm not seeing it. And yeah. Of course you yeah. do see the, the, the lost decade is staring you right in the face. And again, once, once again, I will tip my hat to Ralph Acampora who called it in 2000 and, uh, at a national convention for better yeah. investing. So good stuff. Yeah. All right. Again, the message here is quite simple. Find better companies at better prices, rinse, and repeat. All right. This is kind of a fun slide that Ken and I stumbled on in the airport waiting to hear from American Airlines. Um, it's a poll that was published in Morning Brew, which is a nice resource if you're not familiar with it. Um, basically just highlighting what some of the young people think embodies financial success your thoughts ken well uh it's obviously skewed towards uh, a generation that i don't belong to uh, there's a couple of of boomers on the list there i guess and uh i really like morgan housel's uh quote that you pulled out mark uh and before the session started i asked you to underline the two words linear thinking uh, i find that one of the biggest differences between students that i taught uh, 30 and 40 and, and uh, 50 years ago, and students that I teach today, uh, young people that I teach today, uh, folks with, with all this screen time, uh, I think are finding it much more difficult to follow a, a good, solid, linear, step-by-step -step group of, of reasoning points to get from a uh, an opinion to a conclusion or a hypothesis to a conclusion. Uh, they seem to be much more scattered and they seem to have a much more difficult time going from A to B to C to D in a linear fashion. Uh, and yet, um, it's, uh, as Housel says, it's, it's much more intuitive if you can set up that uh, chain of, of uh, if this, then this, and if that, then this, and if that, then this. If you can set those up, uh, you can you can really drive home a point rather than kind of being scattered in all directions and trying to bring in, uh, in a lot of cases, completely unrelated um, work to support your your point of view, whatever it happens to be. Uh, yeah, and I, I guess got, I would just got a lot of entertainers on this list, don't we, Mark? <laughs> It, it was Asimov that said that the human brain is not wired to think exponential. Um, yep. Yeah, there's yeah, clearly this is dominated by some of the entertainment people. I mean, Oprah makes the list. Oprah is cool. Uh, Taylor Swift, she's all over the place now. In fact, I think Taylor Swift probably makes my top three. I just admire what she's done. Um, and she's a young person. Um, I did put Wait. Michael Jordan on here because... Um, Michael Jordan has, I don't know, I would estimate three billion, but what's a billion dollars amongst friends? He's been enormously successful, uh, much more so than LeBron James. But uh, some pretty good names on here. There's some, there's obviously some that are missing that we might grab, but it's just kind of fascinating to see where people drift. It is nice to see that uh, Buffett makes the list, one of our leading groundhogs. You know, one, one of the things, Mark, uh, underlining Taylor Swift, uh, and I agree, she is, she's very impressive uh, in a lot of ways, but as a business person, too, um, she avoided, unlike uh, some other high-performing celebrities, uh, endorsing FTX uh, in its heyday, <laughs> if you remember. If you remember. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, fellow, yeah, fellow uh, Wolverine Tom Brady uh, having that Super Bowl commercial. Um, but that was not an accident. Uh, she actually, uh, her dad, I believe, is a, is a certified financial planner. Right? He has he has one of the, some kind of financial uh, accreditation. I think it's financial planner, and she paid attention to that. And she actually looked at FTX's books and said, "Now I'll pass." Wow. Yeah, she's turning down a huge paycheck there to, uh, on principle. That's excellent. And then I, I did stick this one in here for you, Matt, along with the quote. Uh, you came out on the forum and pointed out that Morgan's next book is out. Is that, is that as of today? As of today. Okay. Well, I've never been disappointed by Morgan, so I'll be picking up a copy of that. 
Yeah, I think it's I think uh, it's an interesting follow up to to his last book, Psychology of Money. But the idea of of looking at constants, you know, going back kind of uh, to your points before too, Ken, um, you know, how are people thinking today, or are people understanding really the long stretch of history that that the market has had versus you know if something really is different now, or something has accelerated, or or gone away, or been added. Um, so I, I haven't read it, I haven't even seen the table of contents, but a very interesting approach um, and to uh, long-term thinking in this dynamic environment. I have a hand in the air, Mark. It's our friend, Len Douglas. And Len, if you'll unmute yourself, you're free to speak. Well, I uh, posted this in the uh, chat, but Taylor's uh, father, Scott Kingsley Swift, is a former stockbroker for Merrill Lynch. And her mother, Andrea Gardner Swift, uh, is a former homemaker who previously worked as a mutual fund marketing executive. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I bet. I wonder uh, why uh, the girl uh, isn't buying any. Uh, <laughs> uh, that might be a family that has their own investment club. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. And we also have one of our uh, audience, Richard, uh, wants to know, how can he invest in Taylor Swift? He, forget the stocks. How can he invest in Taylor Swift? All right. Interesting thought. We'll have to be watching for that. I don't Scooter Brown that. tried it, but uh, yeah. Taylor ended up re-recording everything to get around him. So. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, uh, right. Thanks, Len. All right. Pressing on. All right. Checking yeah, in. And I, what, just one thing. I Go back a minute there. Sure. Please, I'd like to say that there are one, two, three, four women on here out of 11. <laughs> so that is like, you know what? We're getting better because we're getting up there. That, you know, that's not 30%, but we're getting there. There's there's probably a Kardashian just off the list. Oh, God, don't mention that. A whole cluster of Kardashians, Mark. It's <laughs> just like a charge of rhinos, a cluster of Kardashians, okay? <laughs> All right. All right, pressing on. Here's a look at our Groundhog Challenge. It has improved immensely in the last four stock market days. Um, everybody on the list is back to over a million in our top 40. Um, Ann Renly takes over the lead again. Uh, David Einhorn is pushed down to third, but the really important stuff here is I'm back on the list. That's the first and <laughs> foremost, but you can actually cue the music, you know, the theme music from the movie Jaws because uh, Marie Frank down there at number 33 moved all the way from 64th to 33rd. I moved from 49 to 29. So just be ready for us, people. We're coming. <laughs> We are. I that, we are. I see. I see that Anne is in the audience. Uh, Anne, we have some other folks in the audience that are interested in where your home base is. Where do you live, Anne? Could you just either unmute yourself and talk, or if you don't want to talk, uh, send me a, a chat in the question box, and and I'll report it. There, Anne has her hand up, and uh, Anne, you'll have to unmute yourself. I can't unmute you. You're muted yourself. You'll have to look at the questions box and and press the little microphone icon. Okay, maybe you can just give me some text, Dan, and tell us where you're from then, okay? Yeah, because her she made six selections. It. And, you know, when you divide up your million groundhog dollars by six, you start with 166,666. $67. So she's got five out of six winners there. Well, Len just made my heart stop on the questions box here, Mark. Uh, he just posted that Artelex broke $44 a share. Now, he quickly said that was a fat <laughs> finger on the keyboard, and he meant $4 a share, but he just made my entire body quake there for just uh, a moment. Yeah, <laughs> if, if, it, if it's 44 this broadcast is over. <laughs> we're all over. We're, we're going out. Mark's treat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right so um, um yeah kim will be saying cha-ching cha-ching <laughs> so, all right enough enough banter uh kathy wood by the way did move up 38 slots last week so she's also dangerous okay good stuff all right and now ken this is this is our fun moment we have promised each other 
we're only going to do this monthly, but I, I'm just saying we need to, we need this. Um, we haven't seen a chart like this in I'm over a year. Stop you before you get going, Mark. Anne got herself unmuted, so okay. Anne, go ahead and talk to us, okay? Hi, guys. Yeah, um, hey, I currently live in Lincoln, Nebraska, and um, I'm a member of uh, Research Investors here in Lincoln for several years, and um, I have learned a lot from listening to you guys over the last 10, 15 years. So I thank you very much. And every morning I come in and look to see where I am on the on the list. So and I am anyway. I am so happy to hear that you're a Midwesterner, Anne. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. And Thanks for unmuting. We appreciate it. And Kay Light also is online. She's from Hastings, so we're definitely Nebraska represented. Good stuff, corn huskers. All right. So again, um, back to this. We have not seen a graph like this in over a year. And uh, those rabbits are shocked, but for good reasons this time around. And uh, Ken and I have promised each other that we're only going to look at this about once a month because he think it, he thinks it's bad luck and jinxes us to look at it any, <laughs> any more than that. And I don't normally believe in luck. So, <laughs> <laughs> so We actually were above 1.1 million. I, I don't want to. I don't want to hear it. Let's just okay. continue to the next slide yeah. now. Here we and go. This, this <laughs> one was completely dripping in green ink until just recently. So, we'll just leave it at that. These are the twenty selections we made for twenty twenty four, and uh, we just. I will <laughs> remark about the bottom of the list, Mark. Uh, they had a wonderful yeah. earnings report. Uh, evidently, uh, it's going to be torn apart a little bit because they went quite a ways down yesterday, but they're back up today about 6 or 7%. So uh, Technoglass is, you could say it's one of the more volatile selections on the list, at least at the moment. Sounds like it. Yep. Yeah, I would say too, guys, Shockwave. It's Shockwave uh, beat revenue and earnings, reaffirmed forecast for 23 and 24, and is down almost 16% today. <laughs> oh, I'll have more. I'll have more to say on that uh, in the forum. Uh, there appears to be a New York Times article, not about their process, but about. Uh, and I'm, it's one of those words that Ken will love to uh, to pronounce. Uh, but it's a different procedure uh, that actually does cut out the plaque uh, arthur arthrectomy uh, that the New York Times had a bit of an expose on that that. Uh, going minds around other boards think might be impacting it. But I'll, I'll, I'll also say I'm going to post a decisions manifest, bought some shock, more shockwave today. Yep. Uh, Mark, Sandy is uh, just reminding you that uh, uh, Celsius is going to split three for one pretty soon. So keep an eye on that. So if it moves to the bottom of the list very quickly, it's not due to anything other than the fact that the stock split, okay? S Sandy uh, is always looking out for me. I appreciate that, Sandy. Right. <laughs> and Ty is is reporting that that most of that gain in NAPCO occurred in the last week since uh, since NAPCO's earnings. And, and the stock is up 25% since the day it reported earnings from 18 to $24. So that's a golly, that's a that's a thirty three percent move, Ty. Uh, that's a six dollar move on an eighteen dollar stock. So that's a big move uh, in just a very short amount of time. So oh. the list is brand new and it has a year to go yet. So we don't want to get too excited too soon. There may be a little truth to the rumor that I called Ken two days into the new year and asked if we could lock the results in. So <laughs> no, I'm kidding. All right, here's a quick look at the steel cage challenge, uh, the cage, cage match challenge. I did add, Matt, I added your two banks in there, and you're winning. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. Other... <laughs> yeah, we're just, we'll just, uh, the, these are the results so far. We will talk more about this in the future. You are invited if you're not afraid of the fame or shame uh, of putting your name on this board. If you have a situation that you see a stock that really you think, could even be a good company, but you think it's headed south uh, price-wise. Um, so I, I do insane. peer into the future occasionally, Mark. So I think you should do a, a quantifier and maybe say that uh, we'll take as many as three entries from any one person, but that's it. We won't take more than three. Uh, well, so, all right. Uh, uh, yeah, we don't want to kill my spreadsheet too much. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so... <laughs> 
All right, let's get on with this. Uh, again, here's a slide that we use at, at uh, full sessions quite often. We call it performance perspectives. And again, this is those top seven companies most widely followed by Manifest Investing subscribers. And I suspect that you find, I know that you do, you find, you're going to find them near the top of the BI, top 100 in the Bivio, uh, top stocks that are held. And in comparison to that 10% uh, Wilshire down below here. And we just kind of use this as a demonstration of, you know, here's all the indices down here. Again, all of them right around 10%. Again, this is not to say that index or passive investors are a bad thing for some people. It's a heck of a lot better than stuffing a mattress. But uh, this slide does illustrate what is possible if you go out there and find these types of companies. And, and we believe, we really believe that you're, when you're investing with friends, like around here, um, you're more likely to find these. As an evidence of that, we, we would point to the round table. Uh, the round table since July 2010 is literally just three or four or five people coming together every month to share an idea. And that is cranking along at a pretty decent return. So again, just yeah. reinforcing some long-term concepts. Mark, back up a slide, would you? I know how difficult it is to talk and to try to uh, mark slides and everything. Uh, mark meant to circle the column one to the left right there. The column he circled is the benchmark return, and the actual annualized return for all the different things is right next to it. And again, you can see that they're all hovering around 10 right there. Uh, that consistent one is the one we're comparing everything to, and that's the Wiltshire 5000. Absolutely. All right, so you know, taking that into account, this is something that we shared with the Louisiana audience, and uh, I'm ashamed to admit I'd almost forgotten that we have some of these at our fingertips at Manifest Investing. These are all the things you can screen on. In fact, it's not all of them, but it's most of them. But screening by triple play, we obviously talked about that by return, by a uh, combination of forecast, return forecast and quality. Growth itself, I mean, we fill in a 12% here and look for our best small companies. Um, these are all there. But the one that we really spent some interesting moments with after I was ridiculed about mixing up my <laughs> Swiss Julie Andrews with uh, apparently the British one. <laughs> he, Mark's, Mark's full of Mary Poppins on the uh, <laughs> the graphics here, but his song is... Uh, is uh, 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 <laughs> from Sound of Music, so uh, it, it happens, Mark. Don't worry I, about it. Okay? I'm going to find an appropriate <laughs> picture to add to this, Con. <laughs> well, I I put a few Alps in there and maybe an Edelweiss somewhere, you know? Okay, I don't even know what an Edelweiss is. I just know it's a song. It's a, it's a flower. Maybe you can do Raindrops on Roses. That's the first line <laughs> of my favorite thing song, okay? I wasn't a I wasn't a musical theater director for 35 years for nothing, okay? <laughs> All right, so moving on to this, let's talk core. And uh, you know, keeping a healthy core is an important thing. Now, that happens to be an unauthorized photo of me coming off the tennis court a few years ago, snapped by Mr. Kavula. Um, no, 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 I didn't take any picture <laughs> like that, okay? <laughs> Or at least not of you. <laughs> well, some some of the people in New Orleans liked it. Others were a bit skeptical about it. But just just to reinforce, and again, as I mentioned earlier, this is uh, something that Kevin uses quite a bit, and we all do indirectly in in, way, in a way. But uh, we sat down one day and tried to define mathematically slash with an algorithm what might an investor think of as core. And the three blue arrows up at the top are the three characteristics we basically added up and and stacked them up and said, you know what? Anytime that those three things add up to about 225, and this is a squishy number, uh, but anything above 225, and you're probably talking about a company, you know, an investment that many people in our community would begin to regard as core. And so you're looking at uh, these three things on display you can sort by the core score, those three numbers added up together. And the thing we spent some time talking about is the fact that uh, three of those seven long-term leaders from the performance perspective end up on this chart. The rest, and this is sorted by core score, but notice that uh, 
Well, I think maybe it was sorted by par and it just got updated. It, it is sorted by par, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you're going to be shopping at the top of this chart and I think comfortably shopping for most people. What do you think, Ken? Well, we, we first of all made the the uh, caveat uh, to remind the, everybody that's looking at it that a high core score does not necessarily mean uh, that it's investable at a particular moment and it doesn't mean, mean that it's going to make you a lot of money, but a high core score certainly gives you uh, some outstanding companies to form an idea list from. And when you sort it by par, I mean, I would go down to at least alphabet. Maybe I'd go all the way down uh, sorting it by par. Now, this is an, uh, a, a kind of a bad sort because maybe the pars have changed a little bit since uh, the sort mark, but I might go all the way down to uh, SEI investments uh, to say to myself, those all seem to be fairly investable. My experience has been that a, a par value of somewhere around 12 on up uh, usually results in a buy on my SSG that I do. So uh, you, you certainly can submit these all to SSGs or you can just use the idea of par to begin with. Mark's going to go to the actual screen itself and see what it looks like. Why not? Let's go see how much has changed. Yep. So all I'm doing is going into manifest investing, going to the screen, and going down to the core A score. Single number. Yep. Just put in that 288. You could put in 290. It would not change dramatically. And we'd allow you to do 285 if you want. The number is not that important as okay. long as it's considerably above 225. Now, I want to fully disclose that Gentex did not pay for this moment, but they just took over first. Yep. And again, there's some pretty decent companies on here. Uh, I don't know. This may have just become my favorite screen. Yep. You know, I spend enough time with Ken on the road that the uh, uh, up straight and parallel is kind of imprinted on my brain. So many of these are going to be up straight and parallel, if not all of them. Yeah, and there's a couple, even for those folks that are doing invest, uh, doing a dividend investing, and I know we have people in our audience that, that really, really uh, look for high dividend payers. I even see a couple of pretty decent dividends uh, on the, the, the list here that might be something that would be interesting. I'm, I'm looking at paychecks, for example. An 11% par is probably up near the top of the range uh, for paychecks, isn't it, Mark? Yeah, yeah, I mean, and, and uh, as you said earlier, many of these companies do not get, you know, we, we've talked over the years, companies like Johnson & Johnson, the par doesn't get that high and it doesn't get that low. It kind of percolates in that mid-range. And uh, I think these companies are probably, even though they're not in the sweet spot, they're probably in their own form of a, a core sweet spot, if you want to think of it that way. Interesting to see ResMed on the list also, Ken. Absolutely. and. Uh... I really like the fact that Gentex is up there at the top. It happens to be a, a stock that I own a, a reasonable amount of, and more importantly, my family club owns a reasonable amount of it. So that's an interesting play uh, going forward. Nice, nice. Where were, oh, Gen, they just switched places with I just, each other. Okay. Yeah, they just switched yeah. places. So, yeah, yeah, I may have to, in honor of this, buy some Gentex here fairly soon. Um, but yeah. yeah, so again, now, that's that's a pretty dated picture of me, so I uh, things have shifted <laughs> around a little bit. So, for th for those of you questioning where the two eighty eight comes from, it's a number plucked from thin air. Uh, we know that core is is definition is kind of squishy around two twenty five, but we feel that core is pretty well established by the time it gets to two sixty five or two seventy. So we picked a number high enough to make sure that we're looking at a list that really represents uh, this idea of uh, consistency and this idea of long history and all the other things that go into core, high quality, all that stuff. So 288 is just a pluck, pluck from the ether kind of number. Uh, and you might play with this a little bit because it's such an easy screen to create. I mean, see what happens when you go down to 270. See what happens when you go up to 295, uh, you know, and play with it in between. Yeah, and I would also point out that Kevin did an excellent presentation 
on ResMed and the triple play and, and core, the core score during the most recent round table. So good stuff there also. He had a, a really great take on how you could tell a triple play directly from the visual analysis of the SSG. Uh, it's a little bit high level. Uh, it's not a, a presentation that you want to start a beginner out on, but if you have been investing for a while, and if you do appreciate uh, playing with that graph, that visual analysis graph, uh, look at the presentation that Kevin made. It's on YouTube, the uh, last round table from the last Tuesday. Actually, we did it November 1st, didn't we, Mark? Because we the last Tuesday was Halloween, so it's dated November 1st. And uh, I, it was the first time I had seen core, or not, not core, but triple play defined in that manner. Uh, he hits all the high points and uh, makes really valid uh, conclusions by looking only at the graph, the, the visual analysis. So nice, nice job. And then as, just for playing around, I'll give you some homework. Put in 288 over here and get that previous list. And then come over here and click the triple play and see what you end up with there. That could be fun. All right, moving on. We are going to cover the our favorite screens as one of the features of this particular event. And Ken, would you like to share some more details on this? Well, again, this will be our 20th anniversary program. Uh, we're going to spend the first 15, 20 minutes. We're not going to take a lot of time talking specifically about the Mid-Michigan contest. Uh, by now, the, the folks that won the contest know that they've won the contest, and uh, the folks that didn't win the, win the contest don't want us to broadcast that especially. Uh, I, I will say that we have a very special winner uh, in the contest this year, and we'll keep that a secret until the uh, until the presentation tomorrow night. Uh, uh, a non-competing entry won uh, for the for the be, fifth time in twenty years. So uh, that would be ineligible for prize money type. Ineligible winner. for prize money, right? But but <laughs> eligible for all the bragging rights you can grab. So that's happened five times over the twenty years, and we'll. Well, We'll talk about that. Um, uh, and, I'm certainly uh, not going to disclose either who who the winner is or whatever. But Ken, I need some uh, some weights and dimensions for my my mantle for my trophies. <laughs> we we uh, way to way to mess it up. Okay, <laughs> we we also uh, plan on taking as much time or as little time as we need to answer questions from our audience, especially about clubs, about specific situations, about portfolio management. Uh, we find these sessions where uh, you just pull together a, a group of people that are not only interested in investing, but are leading their clubs uh, in a lot of activities. And they come up with great questions a lot of times that not only help them manage their clubs in a better way, but helps all of us manage the club that we're involved with. And if we're not involved with the club, help helps us do a better job of managing our individual portfolios. So uh, we're, we're going to aim the whole thing at about 90 minutes. Uh, if it goes a little bit shorter, we won't be sad. And if it goes a little bit longer, we're going to stick with it until we get those questions, or at least the germane questions answered. Uh, we're not immune to having questions off the wall and uh, we've gotten pretty good at sorting those out and nobody takes offense yeah, if you want to register for that webinar mark's pointing to it right down there yeah the link would be on the mid michigan chapter page on better investing and then we also have it on our home page at manifest yeah. investing all right yeah. so we're going to close with what i think is a fairly interesting demonstration for many of you this will be preaching to the choir but it does provide reinforcement for a concept uh, we want to use our utility auto pay uh, demonstration to basically ponder the question of tax loss selling. So does that set the stage good enough for us, Ken? I think that's a great introduction, Mark. All right. So this is the status of the portfolio on the upper top. As a quick reminder, back in May 2021, we put together this util uh, portfolio of five utilities, approximately $9,000 invested into each one along with a couple hundred bucks of cash. And the whole premise is to have this portfolio pay the bills. And uh, that's what you see down under the transaction ledger. So you're actually looking at the fourth quarter 
of 2023. That would be the bottom half of this screen. And the, the important column is over here on the far right. That is literally the checkbook balance. After making all of these utility payments and accepting all of these dividend infusions, we want to keep that column on the far right positive. And uh, the stuff down that is shaded in, does it come across as brown or light yellow on screens, Ken? Kind of an orangish, kind of an orangish color on my screen, but it's definitely shaded, Mark. Yeah. So that stuff at the bottom should be regarded as budget. Most of that stuff is more than an estimate. That's what's going to happen. The JEPI, J-E-P-I dividends, we're going to talk about that in a second, are estimates, and they are variable. Okay. Yeah, Anything and else, we yeah, and since we began this uh, experiment, we've allowed the electrical bill to uh, move upward. We have not kept a constant electric bill. Uh, most of you know that your utility costs uh, are generally on an upward trend, and we've kind of mimicked that uh, in the the uh, simulation here so that uh, it's something that you can actually do uh, as an individual and uh, if you do set out to make this happen, uh, setting up the spreadsheet is extremely easy. And if you're new to spreadsheets, I think Mark or myself, either one of us would be happy to help you set up a spreadsheet because it really is a fairly simple spreadsheet to deal with. And it's a lot of fun. Um, here's a look at that JEPI item because one of the things that we will point out here is it was not our, our choice, but South Jersey Industries was sold back in February of this year for $36, and we paid $26 for it. So we have a capital gain. We took that money and we diverted it down into this JEPI because we wanted to, as a group, learn about it. So JEPI is what's pictured here. It basically is an investment in some higher quality companies in the S&P 500, and they basically use covered calls to to, to generate hybrid uh, premium income. And uh, the, the yield of this particular fund, it's an ETF, uh, is run, tracking in the 9 to 10% range. And just to show you the amounts, because when we first got involved with this, my first reaction was, how could this be real? And I don't understand it. But the companies that are involved are on the right. These are the actual monthly it pays monthly, uh, monthly amounts. So you can see what has been happening. It was easier to make money with covered calls in the early part of the year, but they still have done a pretty decent job here in the last few months. And the companies on the right are uh, household names and community favorites for us. Anything else here, Ken, that needs to be? Well, I, I just, I just want to say if, if your portfolio doesn't contain at least three or four of the stocks on this list on the right, then uh, you you really are an outlier as far as better investing groups is concerned. Uh, this is this could be a a poster child for uh, choose from this list to create a better investing portfolio kind of thing. Yep. So that's what's that's what's laying that's the underlying investment for this particular exchange traded fund. So with that in mind, here is a look at the current situation. Only what I've done is you know the 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 fourth quarter of this year is on display up at the top with the year end. Keep in mind, anything shaded is budgetary. And uh, we just have this reality of Uncle Sam. I guess I should have put the bull there with the Uncle Sam hat on. We're going to owe taxes on our interest dividends and long-term capital gains this year, coming here in April. So we're getting prepared for that. We are noticing a number that we don't like right here. We want to keep that number positive as we can and there's only a couple ways to do that we'd have to sell some stock or whatever but uh ken and i were sitting literally sitting in the airport we said what if we thought about a simple tax loss sale a little bit of switching and what would that do to this situation so you're ready to take a look ken you want the answer to the quiz Ta -da! Yep. <laughs> So here's what we ended up taking a look at. Here are the, the, the utilities in their current situation. Uh, yeah, there are two that have a loss that we could take advantage of. Essential Utilities, WTRG, and uh, Next Era Energy, interesting company. Um, but they both they both have been hammered by what's gone on in the market. So they both, both are still good companies. They're still very good companies. 
but they have suffered uh, a depression in their stock price. If you're if you're trying to follow along, folks, uh, that cost column, that's the basis. When you're you you all understand basis that word, and that's the basis, and then right next to it is the current price. So it's pretty easy to pick out the ones that are losers from the ones that are winning right now. Yeah, so you know these are the two that have uh, the potential for uh, losses, long-term losses. And uh, I don't know, I look at the two, first of all, I consider these two numbers to be the same, basically 12 or 13% par. These are good companies. I just selected because uh, essentially utilities because it's got a slightly larger loss, it's got a slightly lower growth rate, slightly lower quality again there's nothing wrong with this company it's just giving us a tax loss selling opportunity That's and really mark i think we i think we basically made the decision between the two not by looking at what was the worst but by focusing on what was more positive and of all the numbers that you can look at on the lines of those two companies i think that 9.7 stands out more than anything else and makes that the winner rather than making essential utilities the loser. So we decided to sell a small piece of essential utilities. And here's what it actually ends up looking like. We take and we sell 50 shares of essential utilities, and we divert that directly into another dose of JEPI, JEPI. And here's what the impact actually shows. Now here's the situation from the, the previous page, the before, if you will. And the impact on the long-term capital gains is shown. And what you end up with is, again, we're selling those 50 shares. We're generating this amount of cash. We're investing it right back into JEPI. So there's no change in the cash balance, really, until you get down here and you start talking about changes in the amount that we owe the government come April 15th. And that actually flips from a negative to a positive. And we also adjusted the shares on JEPI and obviously WTRG going forward. And uh, so there's a situation where all you did was flip 50 shares of essential utilities, flipped them over to JEPI, nothing else changes, your cash balance goes up in your checkbook, and you owe the government less money come April. So I think it's a pretty decent demonstration of how to walk through and think about what happens if I do this sort of thing with a portfolio. Your thoughts, Ken? I think it's elegant. I think it's easy to understand. And I think it's an exercise that many of us that uh, are are sitting with large portfolios, uh, I think it's a, it's a great way to demonstrate maybe to our sons and daughters uh, or to our grandsons and granddaughters how you can actually use a stock portfolio for a very practical purpose and how stocks can serve as a, uh, a buffer to other types of income, uh, other types of investments that you might make as you age. Uh, I just think it's, it's so, uh, and I'm gonna use a mathematics word, it's so elegant. Uh, and when you talk about something that's elegant, you mean something that's simple, easily understood and explains the process. Uh, and I think this does. And the, and the only caveat I would make is I can point to a number of situations during my lifetime. I haven't done a whole lot of this, but uh, I can point to an, a few situations where I said, well, I'll sell it and 31 days later, I'll buy it back if it's still an attractive situation. And somehow life gets in the way. And the next thing I know, it's two years later and the darn thing has gone up uh, a fair amount and you, you have to you have to be disciplined. So I I need a discipline coach, Ken. Well, and uh, not only do you need a discipline coach, Mark, but as things change uh, on this spreadsheet, I mean, there's a lot of forecasts on here right now from 12, 1, 23, all the way through 24. Those are all forecasts. But as they become reality, you can change those numbers. And if the electric bill should change in two months, you can change the electrical, the utility payment. Uh, and the beauty of a spreadsheet is all the rest of the arithmetic then changes if you set it up correctly. Yeah, and as it stands right now, the electric bill will go down compared to the average retail cost of electricity as it stands Great. right now. Great. All right.
good enough. I, I would just encourage people to understand if you have somebody in an investment club that doesn't understand why you would propose uh, tax loss selling, um, this is an example. All right. Coming attractions, we'll come back to this in the future. I do want to spend a fair amount of time talking about uh, this one from Brian Feraldi, uh, the difference between a distressed company and a distressed price. Here's a reminder that we archive all of these on YouTube. And as we were mentioning, this particular demonstration includes Kevin's look at uh, ResMed. The other one I would point out, especially if you have friends that are working for the government or in the military, this is Ty Hughes' presentation on the TSP or Thrift Savings Plan, and that is a fairly popular topic to sink your teeth into. All right, so with that, I'll just leave you with this with our cover slide from New Orleans. And uh, it was a great weekend. I want to thank and reach out and thank and uh, wave some beads. I don't know why. What, what, what do you what do you do, Ken? Well, honk the horn. In the direction of Andrew Lennon, and uh, Dennis Malcolm was a gracious host for us, and we just want to say as, we had a great time. As were as were all the directors in the La Mes chapter. Our hats are off to what they're doing down there. Uh, it was one of the most engaged audiences that we have encountered, and as I said earlier, it was by far the best room I have ever, without exception, the best room that I have ever taught in. Uh, really appreciate that. Uh, come together again. Let the good times roll. I'm just <laughs> translating the French for the rest of you. And I, I think it's a wonderful thing to rassemble. Rassemble? Rassemble. 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 <laughs> uh -huh. All right. So we'll leave you guys with our tagline from uh, that we've been using for a while now. It's okay to imagine good things. All right. Anything else, Ken? No, I think we're in good shape, Mark. All right, I'm going to go ahead and shut down because I have some personal business to attend to. All and right. I will be back in touch with you soon, Ken. Good night, everybody. Good afternoon, rather, everybody. Afternoon. Uh, glad to have you with us. Take care out there. Bye-bye.